Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are back with another installment of the Muscle Group series. In this series, we take a deep dive on specific muscles each episode. You'll notice we've done the lats and upper back slash rear delts so far. And in these episodes, you're learning the function of specific muscles, common training mistakes and misconceptions about those muscle groups, go-to exercises, and why we program them for clients. And some of the key execution cues to nail down your technique. So today's episode will cover the deltoids, mainly the medial or side delt or lateral delt, depending on the semantic battle you'd like to have, and the anterior front delt. So as always, we, we like to mention this sort of kind of preface things at the beginning. We're not here to exhaust and explain every bit of these anatomical structures. If you guys want to do that, get an anatomy book um, or, you know, get the 3D medical app that we, we linked in the show notes. Those are great apps if you want to take a deep, deep, deep dive. These episodes are really here to bring application to your training with that fundamental knowledge of anatomy. You know, this is what has taken our training uh, ourselves to the, to the next level. This is what's taken the training for our clients to the next level is understanding this, this fundamental anatomy. And so we're going to give you the tools to best understand this anatomy and to basically utilize it within your training sessions and within your training programming as well. Okay, so kind of take that into to this episode as well as the other ones if you haven't listened to those quite yet. All right, so the front slash side delts. All right, so the main role of the deltoids in training is to aid the raising or ex extending of the arm. So to, in today's episode, we're mainly talking about the front and side delt. So we're mainly gonna be talking about that raising component, right? That abduction component of the arm, all right? So the front delts, the more the anterior delts, again, depending on what semantic battle you'd like to have, flexion or raising the arm up in front of the body. That's the main function that we're gonna be talking about today. Again, you can get deep in the weeds of nomenclature, flexion or raising the arm up in front of the body. That's what you need to understand when it comes to training, okay? And again, like other episodes and other muscle groups, we're gonna have a YouTube uh, playlist linked so you guys can go check out our videos walking you through the application of these <clears throat> and this information into practice, all right? And then the other, the middle or medial or lateral head of the deltoid, that middle portion between the, the front delt and the rear delt. The main role is abduction, okay? Raising the arm away from the body, out to the side in any given direction, right? There, there can be a lot of different directions that we're moving that arm. Um, there is more of a sort of an optimal position for that to get the best range of motion and, and utilize those, those medial tissue, that medial tissue the best we can. And we'll talk about that today and we'll show you some of that in the YouTube series as well, all right? And then in the rear delt, um, mainly the function of the rear delt's extension, right? We talked about that in the last episode. If you guys wanna learn more about the rear delts, upper back, how they all come together, uh, go to episode 20. So the deltoids are a very involved muscle group, as you guys know, as you guys have sort of made sense of up to this point, and they have numerous functions, right? To help us pick up and move load, stabilize load, that sort of thing. And due to the repetitive usage of the delts in our daily lives and in our training, it's important that we train these muscle groups using different loading methods, rep counts, exercises, et cetera, right? And we'll be going through those um, again within this episode and throughout our time on our YouTube series. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sue here and we're gonna kind of transition um, back and forth between uh, common practices, training mistakes, uh, best exercises, and we'll, we'll intertwine more anatomy, knowledge, and application uh, throughout. Awesome. Well, I wanted to go over momentum, but I'll go over that here in a little bit. I really wanted to talk about setup um, and what that looks like. Uh, dumbbell lateral raises, dumbbell over pre overhead press um, and front raises are extremely common exercises that I see in people's training. And so it's something that um, it's also an extremely common exercise I have to critique within clients training. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what that setup is. And like Austin alluded, there is going to be a video in the show notes. So one of that is looking at your front delt. So 
within the front delt first training it at a slight incline is a really, really positive. Just again, lining up that tissue with that resistance and making sure that you're able to be in the absolute best and most advantageous position. But within your front delt, it's something that you're not just moving straight from your side and then straight in front of you. Um, it's something that is often trained um, in more of this V shape as you raise up to the front. Um, and within that front raise, it's something that I often see the range of motion. And we'll talk a little bit more about range of motion and um, later on, uh, people will start from the side of their body and go like up above their head. Um, but when you are training that front delt, it's something that you basically only want to go up until where your clavicle or like you can think about getting your thumb to your nose. Um, but you don't want to go too far past that. It's not something that you just keep raising and going because it's actually going to have a drop off of tension there. Um, but within the front delt, something I wanted to mention is that I've heard a lot of people talk about how you don't have to train your front delts because you get enough volume from other pressing movements. So I really wanted to talk about this first. Um, so this is and isn't true. Um, within male training, there's normally more pressing, more chest movements, um, and it's something that they are getting a lot of secondary uh, volume from doing pressing movements. But it's something where I have the, the thought process that you do want to train um, each muscle group in its intended uh, range of motion and path of motion um, to make sure that you are mechanically and technically moving your body in the way that it's supposed to move. Um, I still think secondary volume is phenomenal, but it's something that you also want to take into account that moving it in the plane that it's supposed to be moved is extremely beneficial, even if you're not trying to grow the muscle. Um, so that's something where um, we've mentioned it in other episodes, but I think it's worth mentioning in each one that we're going through this is that there is a difference between a maintenance volume and then biasing that muscle group and having more volume to to be able to grow it. Um, so if you're not wanting to grow your front delts, you have a ton of pressing movements in, you could have enough volume that you don't have to train those independently. Um, but especially if you are not doing an excess of pressing movements, you're not going to be getting that same amount of volume. So it is important to train that front delt um, in that path. So that's something I just wanted to touch on because it is something I've heard before um, as far as, oh, you don't need to train front delts, you get enough of that. And I wanted to kind of give my thoughts on that. Um, and then if anyone else wanted to weigh in. I, I want to come back to the the first point you talked on of the, the incline aspect of, of training the front delt. So uh, the reason for that uh, is that it's going to be dependent on your overall flexibility and your mobility within your shoulder joint. So if someone is sitting at a perfect 90 degree angle, it may work for some individuals, uh, depending on their mobility and those different factors, but allowing for that slight degree or, you know, great degree of incline, not getting to that full 90 uh, degree setting of the, the bench, maybe 70 uh, degrees. It allows for you to be in a better spot for you specifically and not being so kind of like pinched into a position that your mobility doesn't allow for. Uh, and it allows for us to potentially have a, a greater range of motion and time under tension for the anterior delt to be under. Um, and just overall allows for you to not be in as much of thoracic extension, allows for you to stabilize the core, just puts you in a, a, a better spot from a safety perspective, as well as um, any limitations that you may experience because of lack of mobility and those different aspects. Yeah. Um, that was very, very well put. I guess I glossed over that a little bit there. Um, but when it comes to um, the front delt, as Alex mentioned, that um, just being able to be in that little bit more better positioning for you and more comfortable position also. Um, and that's something that you'll also see within videos when we talk about doing a front delt press. Um, so like I mentioned, the overhead press, the dumbbell shoulder press is an extremely popular movement, but you can specifically train the front delt in a pressing movement as well. And that's also going to be at that slight incline um, and being able to have your, your elbows more towards the midline instead of out more towards the side. Um, and 
and being able to press in that. So if you listen to the last episode, we talked about how when your arms are further away from your body, obviously you can't do as much load. Um, so that same with lateral raise when your arms are super far away from your body or when we talked about the rear delt fly or flies in general. Um, and so it's something where a front raise and a lateral raise, your arm is straight out. You normally will see, hey, I can only do 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds and that's my max. You don't normally see people grabbing a 100 pound dumbbell and doing a front raise. Um, and if they could, that would be quite impressive. Um, but for a, if you're really wanting to get a little bit more um, tension on that muscle and being able to have more weight, you can set yourself up in that anterior delt press um, to be able to have a little bit more, again, advantageous to be able to push through um, and load that muscle group more. Yeah. And you guys want to talk a little bit more about um, the momentum factor of things and kind of highlights here as well. Um, the advantages, disadvantages of momentum. Um, and, and we can, we can all kind of touch in, uh, touch in on that. Um, and then also we'll go and kind of go over why it's important that you make, you consider that quote unquote, full range of motion, like traditional full range of motion may not always be the answer in, in, in isolation accessory movements. Right. And we're going to go over that a little bit. Again, this is a nuanced topic a little bit here. Um, and we need you to be open-minded. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to post this to your, your story and like fully commit to this just yet, but like l hear us out. Um, so let's get into momentum really quick. Um, so you have a great video on the YouTube channel about momentum, uh, talking a little bit about resistance profiles and stuff. So momentum is often viewed as bad. And a lot of times you'll see people going through exercises and say, don't use momentum, which as a general rule is a great general rule to have. But there are times where momentum can be very beneficial. And this is what we talked about when we want this to apply to your training. We want you to be able to take something away from some of these to learn something and be like, oh, whether it's a setup or whether it's us talking through um, a certain um, volume allocation or something like that, you're taking this in a applying this to your training. So I want you to apply momentum to your training. Um, and it's something that can be very beneficial, especially if you have limited equipment um, or you're training at a very busy time. So when we're thinking about the uh, lateral raise, it's something that, again, normally you hear don't use momentum if you really want to make sure you're hitting your delts. And I've definitely seen someone do like a full body thrust as they're trying to do a lateral raise. And that's not what I'm uh, focusing on when I talk about momentum. Um, um, so when it comes to momentum, momentum changes the amount of tension on the muscle through the range of motion. So the more momentum you have on a concentric, the lighter the weight gets as you progress through the movement and decreasing the tension the muscle needs to create to move it. So this can be a good or a bad thing depending on how you apply it. A lot of these concepts all depend on how you apply it to what you're doing and what your end goal is. So if I'm going to do a normal lateral raise, um, it's something that it's very heavy at the top and it's lighter as you get to um, your arm closer to your side. So when your arm's up and you're in that um, the top of that lateral raise, that's when it's the heaviest. Now, if we use a little bit momentum at the end, and that's going to be working your, um, the shortened delt is going to be worked during a lateral raise. Um, then if we are to take it and use some momentum at the bottom of the movement, again, not a full body thrust where we're just pushing into the air, but really thinking about as you're drawing your arms up, you're pushing down and out. Um, it's something that you are utilizing some momentum at the beginning of that movement. As you go through that, you'll start to notice, hey, at the top of the movement, um, it's actually pretty light where it used to be heavy um, and it's heavier at the bottom. And that's something where you can train um, and hit more of that length and portion of the delt um, while just changing the momentum of it. It's something that tempo also matters in this. Um, it matters for creating and keeping tension, the amount of tension at a given portion of the movement. Um, it's very important to think about that. But if you are thinking about momentum, um, it's something where you can change how you train the delt and hit it in different ways while just changing the way that you use that momentum. Um, so again, it's normally looked at as a bad thing and it's normally looked at as you'll get more 
more traps in the movement. Um, and we can talk about how to make sure you keep your traps out of a lateral raise. But it's something that if you're truly initiating the movement as you normally would, but with more momentum, correct form, you are going to be able to hit that delt in a different way, which is really great because if you are to use the cables, for example, if you were to put the cables at um, the like head of the cable at the bottom, the cables are setting at the bottom and you're doing a cross cable lateral raise, that's again, hitting more of that shortened delt. Um, then if we are going to move the cables to wrist height, which we have a video talking about the low cables versus wrist height. Um, and Alex did a great job in that video explaining it. You'll be able to hit more of that lengthened portion. Um, so you can do it by changing those positions on the cables. You can do it with different exercises, but let's say that you are again, either short on time, short on equipment, or you're working out at a busy gym and you can't superset cer certain exercises. You can utilize momentum to your benefit of, Hey, I'm going to hit this, um, in two different ways or within a different concept to make sure I'm getting the most bang for my buck within my training. There are components to that in the sense of, of what Sue was speaking on is that uh, if you're utilizing the same load and you're wanting to incorporate momentum, first, momentum is going to be an advanced practice where you are going to have to have a, a good understanding of the quality of your positioning and execution within the lateral raise before you even incorporate momentum. Like, I don't want you to listen to this podcast and not have your foundational work done within your lateral raise and be like, okay, you know, Sue said this is still hitting my delts, So I'm going to have a party with mm -hmm. this momentum aspect of things. And so understand that this is going to be more advanced. You're going to have to have a good understanding of how to decelerate the, um, the momentum that you're creating, especially if you are in a place of a superset or, or trying to extend a set of, of some sort. Um, so your ability to decelerate as you get to the top, if you've created so much momentum and force that you are, you know, not having enough tension with the dumbbell itself. Um, so if you are in, in the way that Sue explained it, you would be able to maybe perform your normal set of 15 rep or, uh, 15 pounds for whatever repetition allotment that you have. And then from there, maybe taking a, you know, five to 10 second rest and then going through that with a little bit more momentum with that same load could potentially uh, target the, um, medial delt in that length and state or when your when your arms are closest to your, your body, um, that's when you're going to be targeting that. Now in the setting that it's not extending a set as that was kind of the example, um, and you're wanting to do it just as you're using momentum in general, at that point, you would want to increase load quite substantially. Uh, let's say that you generally will do for like a set of six, maybe you do, you know, 15 pounds on the dumbbell lateral raise. At that point, you may want to start out with 20 to 25 pounds and, and see, you know, really where your momentum can be created from. Of course, this is not like an entire like hip thrust and then trying to like jumping motion. Mm -hmm. it, it is in a controlled fashion, of course. Not a clean and jerk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that would be kind of how to, to utilize that and it's going to be targeting your goal here and you're going to feel some trap tension here reason being for that is that it's a major stabilizer we're not going to completely uh, and we're going to talk on this i'm sure is that um you know, completely disregarding the traps because that's just not possible as it's going to be a major stabilizer as we go into um abduction of, of the shoulder it's going to to be helpful there. So you, you're you wanting to have some tension. Of course, we're not wanting to have all the tension being placed on the traps. Um, but one thing with this momentum based work is that you're going to have sensationally and, and potentially more tension in general being placed on the traps than what you would in your normal, you know, dumbbell lateral raise. Yeah, great points by you guys there. Um, one thing I, I like to kind of say to clients is when, when talking about momentum, because I tend to use this con uh, this uh, technique quite a bit because uh, many of my clients are smaller females in that they don't have the strength necessarily to to move even the lowest setting on a cable lateral raise uh, on their machine. So their cross cable machine, their their functional trainer, right? So a lot of those are really heavy, even on their lowest setting for for cable lateral raises, right? And so. Um, that can be a, obviously a point of frustration if you're trying to, to superset things or it can be a limitation for us. So um, I, I do use this a, uh, a little bit more, I would say, <clears throat> than your, your everyday person. But as far as utilizing this and kind of what I say, and this is kind of my point here, when first starting to create momentum, almost 
so if we let's say we use for our normal you know really good technique lateral raise we use seven and a half pounds let's just say that uh dumbbell and for the momentum work after you do your set of seven and a half pick up the 10 pound dumbbells and you're going to be already a little bit fatigued so that weight's probably going to be a little bit heavier than if you were fresh and almost start the rep as if you're a little you're a little pissed off at it you're a little pissed off at the weight because anytime we're kind of pissed off at something we give a little bit more of that like you know like initial effort of like god i'm pissed you know um so like imagine like pushing it you know pushing over a trash can like you wouldn't just like in a controlled manner push a trash can over you would like full thrust you know like explosive press that trash can away from you right you would you would create momentum that would break you know would create a lot of inertia and and basically send that thing flying i'm assuming right as we all we're all listening to this I'm, i think we can all throw a trash can a quarter mile for sure so as far as cre- that mo- that concept of creating momentum i think that's a good headspace to be in when you're sh- starting to kind of create momentum so if you have a heavier load um or pick up a, a really heavy load you know let's say, you know, instead of the 10s, pick up the 15s or maybe the 20s and start to kind of have that like, you know, headspace where you're like, ah, I'm just a little pissed off. I want to same movement pattern, same, same stabilization, same general uh, technique and execution cues that we'd be using for our, our, you know, normal lateral raises here. But just, you have to almost to move them, you almost have to get, you know, get a little pissed off, right? So you kind of have to start with that initial, uh, sort of jolt of momentum, right? And that to me in my head sort of like is what kind of taught me how to initially create momentum in a controlled manner, right? With with some guidance to it, um, more, you know, some more specificity to to the momentum there. So hopefully if, if what they said didn't help or click, hopefully I did and vice versa, right? I'm hoping we all have different ways of explaining one things. Of it clicked. <laughs> hopefully one of them clicked, right? And, um, what, it doesn't matter which one it is, you know, um, it just hopefully it did. It's like Michael Scott uh, memorizing his deposition, right? Um, what's that? <laughs> Desiree. <What>? De- <laughs> Disrespect. <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I'll go into a few of the other training mistakes um, while also going over some of our favorite exercises to train those muscle groups. So we like to definitely go over those exercises. And then we'll also talk about volume and frequency when it comes to shoulder training. Um, and then a few more application, because I know we talked a little bit about competitors and what that looks like. So um, one of the training mistakes or two of them I wanted to talk about was um, allowing too much tricep as well as um, the range of motion again. Um, while, and I thought it would be helpful to go over a popular movement like the dumbbell overhead press and talking about both of those and how those um, relate while also giving you, again, actionable things when you're looking at a dumbbell overhead press. And if you are watching this on uh, YouTube, it is something where I'm going to be moving my arms just for my brain to also work and tandem the way I want to. Um, so that is why I'm moving even if other people cannot see me. Um, so when we're thinking about the dumbbell overhead overhead press. And something that active range of motion is something that is not um, often utilized. Uh, um, I see people come and if you if you're thinking about a dumbbell overhead press, your arm is going to be out to the side, um, you're going to have a 90 degree angle, your forearm is going to be um, perpendicular to the floor, you're going to be good to go in that range. A lot of times I see people and your elbow should basically be in line based uh, for the most part with your shoulder um, in that that range. Um, so I see a lot of people have their elbow and bring it all the way down to their side and then press all the way up and think about getting their elbow to their ear. Um, this you'll, you'll feel the load and you'll feel the jamming of your shoulder as you're pressing this weight, but you won't necessarily be getting the most bang for your buck for that medial delt. Um, so it's something for that active range of motion, your elbow can definitely drop below parallel, um, in regards to where your shoulder is, but we want to assess, okay, when do I start to feel that tension drop off? As soon as first my shoulder rolls forward at all, tension drops off. Um, and it's something as soon as my elbow drops to a 
certain point, tension drops off. So it's not about having the biggest range of motion as it is having the range of motion that's going to help you the most. Um, so it's something that, okay, that elbow is going to go a little bit um, below where that shoulder is. And as you press up, think about pressing straight up. Do not think about getting the dumbbells to touch each other. Do not think about getting your elbow to touch the side of your head. We want to, again, keep that tension. As soon as we press in that um, positioning, we're losing and dropping off a lot of that tension um, as we start to move over. Um, We don't want to be in a place where your hand is like over the midline of your body um, or like directly in the midline of your body because that tension is dropped off. So being able to press straight up um, and your elbow is going to be a little bit further away from your ear than maybe you're accustomed to. Um, Now within that, um, I talked about triceps taking over the movement. So it's something that I often see and I'm sure these other two do too, um, where your wrist is in towards your ear as well. Um, And so it's something where you want to think about keeping your wrist stacked on top of your elbow as you're pressing through the whole entire movement. If you start to bring your wrist and your hand and the dumbbell in towards your head, that's when the triceps are going to start taking over that movement and a lot is going to be dropped off of tension of the medial delt. Um, So those are two examples that you'll see within active range of motion and tricep taking over where you're you're jamming the the shoulder a lot you're you might be moving the weight but you're not actually getting the most bang for your buck um, and what I want to say also about weight and picking up a weight heavier than you might heavier than you should be doing uh, is how I'll phrase it. Um, I get the ego part of it. I sometimes still have a hard time not ego lifting. I get it 100%. Um, But at the end of the day, if you are able to pick up a weight and move it, but not get the intended benefit of it, what is the benefit of moving that weight? And I think it's very easy to think, well, I moved that weight. But if you move that weight incorrectly, it doesn't really matter. Let's say you're doing a driving test and you go up to do the maneuverability. You move your car and you move it the complete opposite way that they want. You're like, well, I moved the car. Well, it doesn't freaking matter because you did not move it in the way that was going to benefit you. So it's something that you always want to be able to think about that. Now, there is some times where maybe you don't have the absolute best tension and tension is something that you have to learn that my muscle connection comes from practice. You're not just going to get it your first go most of the time, Um, but it's something that you do want to put a big focus on of, hey, am I actually moving this weight in a way that's training the muscle group that I want to train? Um, so if you guys have anything to add on either the overhead press or, um, momentum or not momentum, uh, range of motion or tricep. So for the, the medial that I will mention now, the, uh, thing I was going to mention earlier in, in terms of uh, kind of expanding on this topic of, uh, when we brought up momentum and I was talking about, um, you know, the importance of range of motion in these exercises, uh, I will circle back to that. So those of you, who, uh, may be going crazy by this point of like, when is he going to touch on what he said? He really left a cliffhanger out there. Um, so this the, the moment is now. Okay. So put on your listening caps. So as far as uh, the main abductors of the uh, glenohumeral joint, right? That that G- GH joint we talked a lot about, um, you know, in the, the last ep- last couple episodes, really. It's that shoulder joint, right? It's it's um it's where that ball and socket joint is. It's where a lot of movement obviously happens in the, the upper extremities and, and really with that shoulder joint, right? The main abductors of that joint is going to be the anterior and medial delt, like we've been talking about throughout this entire episode. But the other one is going to be the supraspinatus, right? It's a small muscle that is has a main role of abduction, and it lies directly underneath the medial delt, okay? It's positioned a little bit differently, but it has a main abduction role. And just like we talked about within the, uh, what was it? Within the upper back and in my example. So if you heard this example in episode 20, you know, like in a lying leg curl, if our leg is fully straight, we need our, the, the first 15 degrees is mainly calf, right? That gets our leg into a position for our hamstring to take over and, and gain leverage and do the work. We talked a lot about that within the upper back as well with, uh, the things like the teres getting um, things over into a position 
where the bigger trap muscles and rhomboid muscles can, can start to really dominate the movement. Same thing here with uh, supraspinatus, right? So the first zero from zero to 15 degrees, the supraspinatus is the main abductor within that movement, not the medial delt. Okay, so if you're doing a lot of medial delt training and you notice you have this over sort of this overuse injury, this kind of tendonitis forming around your shoulder joint, it could be an overuse injury of, and again, I'm not a clinician, I, I'm not a physio, but it's more or less making sense out of what we're doing here, where people tend to, and I've, I've had this injury before, so sort of working from experience. If the main bulk of your work, you mainly work with loads heavier than you need to be using, and you mainly generate all of the force and most of your momentum to move that weight throughout the range of motion within that first zero to 15 degrees, which is pretty easy to do, then you're really just using the supraspinatus to pass off tension of what's left of the tension throughout the rest of the range of the motion to the medial delt, right? We're not necessarily using the medial delt as that main mover any longer as much as like a secondary mover to guide it through a range of motion rather than actually dominate the movement, right? And so I, I just wanted to highlight that because it's important when we talk about range of motion and the specifics within um, range of motion, that's why you sometimes see us not go all the way back down to, you know, arms touching our side in lateral raises. We, we usually stay within the 15 degree to, you know, the hunt 50, anywhere from 15 to a hundred degrees within our, uh, lateral raises, right? So maybe, uh, that 15 degree mark, just slightly outward where those medial delts gain leverage and then, and can like put half tension on them. And then we move upward just, you know, around 90 degrees or just above, right? And that's a good range of motion, right? It doesn't have to be, that still counts as full range of motion, right? There's no police that's going to come in and, and, take your legs out from underneath you because you're, you know, you're, you're training your medial delts properly, right? It may be a point of education if you do have a uh, form police at your gym to uh, let them know, you know, share this podcast episode with them, share a YouTube channel with them, and um, they can learn a little bit more about that. But that's, that's an important point, right? It, it's to understand, and this is why this anatomy stuff makes, you know, is important and um, where that range of motion does come into play. And, and there's other movements like this, um, you know, the, the lying leg curl is one of them, the really knee flexion exercises is one of them, like the seated leg curl and the lying leg curl, um, where it's important to know what's going to dominate a certain range of the movement, what's going to allow us to really integrate that movement using multiple muscle groups, but dominate it with the main one we're wanting to use, right? So in the lying leg curl, we're wanting to dominate that movement with the hamstrings, not the calves, right? So we need to our technique needs to reflect that. In our video on the seated and lying leg curl on YouTube, uh, Alex does a great job at explaining that. And then same goes with the, the lateral raise, right? And we have, again, videos on YouTube explaining this concept, but I thought that was an important point to, to sort of pull out there. Yeah, and generally speaking, when you're thinking about range of motion, your goal, again, generally, is not to have the dumbbells touch. Like I am trying to, I was trying to think as I was about to say that of how many exercises where I'm trying to get the dumbbells to touch. Um, and I really could not think of one off the top of my head. So it's something that when you're doing a lateral raise, when you bring them in, you don't need to bring them completely to your sides, like Austin said, or down in front of you to touch, which I see often, and then bring it back out to that lateral raise. Um, so within a lateral raise, again, a super popular exercise. One thing um, is that traps often over take it. Now we do have a video going over a cable Y raise and a dumbbell Y raise. And the Y raise is a great one to try out if you're still struggling with the lateral raise. But with the lateral raise, a few cues that might be helpful that you might not be doing. So um, I would say that most people end up standing up completely straight, go from the dumbbell at the side of their body up to that 90 degree um, that Austin is talking about. But it's something that you can have a little bit of a hip hinge moving forward. And your arms don't don't have to be perfectly out to your side. They can be a little bit in front of you and you're still going to be hitting that medial delt. 
and you'll have that hip hinge with a little bit of forward um, lean, um, spine still neutral, but you can go with your arms a little bit more in front of you instead of perfectly out to the side. Um, and that's something where if you've been struggling to feel things um, the right way, that's also going to make it so that your trap has to stabilize it instead of pulling up. It's a lot harder to shrug up when you're in that movement um, because you're already pushing forward and leaning forward a little bit more um, to be able to hit that medial delt. Um, but before we get into the rest of the exercises that we really like, Alex, do you want to go over volume and frequency of the small shoulder girdle? How often should you train it and what does that look like? Well, b- before we before we get into that, I think that with the the scapular plane that Sue is speaking on, understanding like if you look at someone extremely lean, uh, you'll be able to see some of those medial delt fibers, and they don't run at like a completely vertical angle. You'll see that when they are in a, a flex position, that they're gonna you know, some of them are gonna run in a vertical plane, and then some of them are going to run kind of at a it's a 45 to 60 degree angle almost. And that's going to be kind of the plane of motion that you're wanting to, to work in within those lateral raises to allow for, uh, you know, a lot of those things that Sue spoke on, but also, um, aligning up with those fibers more specifically and keeping the medial delt in the gravitational plane, um, when you are performing the, um, dumbbell lateral raises. Uh, now from a, a volume perspective, this is going to, to vary, um, quite abundantly in terms of obviously the, the type of stimulus, uh, that is in place as well as if this is a, an emphasis of, of sorts, um, and then understanding that the, um, it is a support tissue to, to a lot of movements, a lot of your pulling movements, a lot of your pressing movements, your medial delt is, is going to play a, a very large role, not a very large role, just a role, I should say, um, within the, the movement of that weight. So understanding that that's going to, if you're, if you're trying to equate perfectly for sets uh, over, you know, a week, the shoulders are going to be one where it's a little bit tough in terms of, of creating that equation. Cause you know, you, you could look at it multiple different ways of like, well, I'm going to account for the, the pressing motion as a half of a set. And then I'm going to r- account for the pulling motion as a fourth of a set or something, you know, r- ridiculous of that sort where it's just getting so nuanced that it doesn't inherently like matter to, to the fullest degree. Um, but from a, a volume perspective, things that we focus on are going to be targeting the, the tissue throughout the week, um, throughout different lengths. So making sure that you are seeing and emphasizing the different lengths throughout the, the week, however you kind of break that down. Those are going to be main components. And, and when we speak on that, that's going to be the, the medial delt in the shortened range, throughout the, the mid range, and then also through the length and position are going to be things of, of emphasis. Um, and then like per session, I, I generally don't like personally like to have more than than 10 sets as a whole i think that you could go like this is one where you can go a little bit higher where like for things such as lats and things of that nature we may not advise you know 20 plus sets or what have you but delts are going to be something depending on you know it's not going to be 20 plus sets for just the medial delt that would be quite ridiculous but i'm saying more so from like the entire shoulder itself um it's going to be you know quite abundant potentially because of the carryover from other muscle groups and things of that nature. And would you say that you can train the shoulder more frequently than other muscle groups? Well, I mean, to a degree, you kind of have to because of just upper body emphasis in general. So if you're training a push session on, on your session one, and then going into a pull session in session two, you're going to have some carryover there. Thus frequency is going to be, um, higher as a whole potentially Uh, now from an emphasis perspective i would still like if you're trying to really bring up your delts as a whole i still wouldn't probably have two days where they're um you know of great emphasis more than that yeah very good points and as far as the the frequency as well and in talking about how tough it is to create damage within the shoulder muscle damage right it's we can create muscle damage quite easily in in muscles like the quads and the the hamstrings and, and things that we can really, really, really load really easily from an, you know, heavily biased eccentric standpoint, uh, and get very lengthened and we can place a lot of tension there and and we create a lot of muscular damage there, right? That, that, that deep soreness that we feel, um, after training sessions for anywhere from one to four to, you know, 10 days, depending on how treacherous your session was. Um, the delts are kind of hard to do that, right? We can, we can drive muscular damage typically through like metabolic fatigue, which is typically you're going to get a lot of, you know, where you have those like giant sets, like, 
you know, these giant supersets where you have like four or five exercises and stuff like that. Um, now, if you're doing stuff like that all the time, then you're probably doing all right as far as like fatiguing, uh, creating muscle damage in those movements. And I'm saying that because the more you're doing that, the less frequency you should probably have, right? The more you're just training them, at, like normally training them with like a, a sort of a, a straight set or a super set or something like that, typically the more frequently you can train them because they're not going to go through it as much muscle damage within their, their, their training experience, if you will. Um, and again, this is a very nuanced topic. We could talk a whole episode about frequency of, of just this muscle group, right? And talking about the different types of training and what that does. But as a whole, if you feel like your delts are a limiting factor within other movements, because your delts do stabilize pretty much everything when you're when it comes to your upper body, uh, push, pull, uh, dead hang, like you on a deadlift, you holding a deadlift bar, your delts are, play a heavy stabilization role within that movement. So if you it becomes a limiting factor within your training in terms of like, I just can't hold this deadlift bar because my delts are so freaking sore and fatigued. Then it's, pr you're probably doing it. You probably have too much volume and you're probably training them too frequently, right? It's sort of like go off feel because I know Alex and I back in the day used to train delts like 30 to 40 sets a week and seemingly were seemed to be fine and had crazy delts. So, you know, it's hard to say, you know, it's hard to put a, <laughs> your finger on it. Um, but Within really exercise selection, um, I'll, I'll end on that and, and see if you guys have anything else. But as far as exercise selection goes, again, head to our YouTube channel. It's a great, great resource, especially um, talking about today's episode. We have a ton of videos on that stuff, uh, going through these different variations. Uh, and really any of these, any division of the delt. So we're talking about front, medial, and rear. Each have a cable, dumbbell, it's sort of have a, a a cable fly raise press variation to them right you can do a lot of different things with these these muscle groups right so you can use cables dumbbells free weights uh, barbells you can use a lot of different stuff right and there's there's different ways you can train them via press fly raise sort of variations right so head to our youtube channel and check those out um and you'll get a little bit more of an idea on the, the specific exercises that we teach and train and use with our clients yeah. Um, so just to list some of those out, you have the cable front um, delt raise, the dumbbell front raise, the and then dumbbell press, and then dumbbell lateral raise, cable lateral raise, that Y raise dumbbell or cable, and then the dumbbell shoulder press, and then rear delt we went over in the last episode. But another one I wanted to add in too was the stepped back um, cable overhead press. And this is great, not necessarily as a main mover, and I'm going to overload this the absolute most, but it's great for if you want to use it as a warm up or just for general shoulder health um, and being able to add in some more volume um, because it is something where with the cable pulling in front of you, you're having to train um, of having that forearm pulled back and pulling against it as you press up. So it's really great for shoulder health as well. But that's what we have for you on delts. So go get huge. Um, and let us know or tag us if you do use some of these tips and the playlist will also be linked with all of the things that we mentioned and couldn't show you. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will see you in the next muscle series episode. See ya. If we missed anything, there is a form below. So fill that out and let us know and also ask questions. See ya.